this is the blurb, and I'm going to make a few comments on it, um, which I've highlighted and underlined. Um, the it forced me to do a kind of a quickie number on Gerard's ideas, um, because not everybody here is Gerardian. Uh, and so I'm going to scroll through a number of slides very quickly with some images. And the images will give you the structures and triangles and things like that. And by the way, I make no proprietary claims uh, on this presentation. If you have any questions or questions that don't get posed or whatever, send an email and I'll send you the whole catastrophe. And you can work on it yourself. A lot of it is borrowed material, anyhow. So the blurb reads about um, picking up in the middle, according to Gerard, quote, saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. He was anticipating the effect of his death and resurrection on cultural, the cultural forms and practices that have protected humanity from its own violence. Um, asterisk is that the uh, all cultural forms and practices, including university life, uh, by the way, and places, things like the Roman Catholic Church, you know, um, are sacrificial. And um, human institutions are born as uh, scapegoating. Homo necons, homo the killer, is homo religiosus. He's also homo mimeticus. Uh, the violence of all is resolved when it turns on uh, the violence of all against one, and that you have the scapegoat phenomenon. And um, I'm quibbling because I'm a professor of literature, so we quibble on the word imaginative reading of literary masterpieces. In fact, what it is, is it's, it's a concise, coherent, excuse me, I'm sorry, interactional and contemporary, especially contemporary reading of literary masterpieces. Um, and she talks about how Gerard anticipated the present moment uh, and serves as a prophetic voice. I just topped off an essay on the prophetic in Abraham Lincoln, in, in Frederick Douglass, and in René Girard. Uh, great literary works are telling us our story. Um, and uh, they have, a, it, it, in their greatness, they have uh, that prophetic dimension. Uh, I quote briefly a very well-known and right justifiably known passage from, um, which I just lost, from Yeats' uh, second coming, the uh, turning and turning, the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dim tide, the blood dim, excuse me, the blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned, the, last, the best lack all convic conviction, and while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That's where we are, there's no doubt about it. And you can sort of fill in uh, with everything you see in the media. I'm gonna talk about Flaubert. Um, there was an item evidently in First Thing, some writer said, I'm tired of hearing about Flannery O'Connor and Manley Hopkins and Dostoevsky and stuff like that. Well, the fact is we haven't got to the depths of all those works. We haven't got to the really prophetic power of them. But um, what interests me is, uh, the Catholic imagination among non-Catholic writers. I'm going to dwell on Flaubert, but I have a short list I can wrap out to you. Uh, I'm particularly interested in a writer like Flaubert who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in anything. He makes a religion of literature, and he knows that it's a God that fails. Um, and I'll do an exercise in close reading because that's what I learned to do with Gerard and Hopkins. Uh, so the... Uh, Dimension of Girard for contemporary times to respond to the, let's say, the theme that Suzanne has brought forward when she talks about uh, the present moment. Girard's last book, Battling to the End, is a book on Clausewitz, and it's a book about the acceleration. It's the widening gyre, the acceleration of violence through history, you see. And the gyre is a wonderful figure, you see. If you've got a ball bearing going around at the bottom of the gyre and it's going at a certain speed, in order to complete that arc towards the top, it's going fast as hell. And that's where we are going. Um, I'm sorry to you know, sound so dire, but uh, this is the apocalyptic dimension of historical reality. Uh, I lead to others to talk about the eschatological one. Um, and Gerard's other wonderful statement is that all great art is incarnational. 
And I asked him what he meant by that, and he didn't get a very clear idea, so I did my own homework on it. And, and for the Catholic imagination, what I've come up with this, at the very least, the Catholic Nomad CI uh, is incarnational. That means it's embodied, it's enfleshed, it's visceral, it's physically grounded. In, 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 and I put Faulkner at the head because his three heirs are Flannery O'Connor, Tony Morrison, about whom nothing needs to be said here because there have been sessions on them, and Cormac McCarthy, all three Catholics, whose apocalyptic vision requires no explanation if you've read Blood Meridian. And uh, Tony Morrison is the one who says, well, I'll go on with my blurb here, that in those writings, you hit a tree line, you hear a gorge, a gully, a river, a stream, a table, chairs. Um, the house of fiction comes because of Balzac, since Balzac, the house of fiction comes furnished. And Balzac, of course, is a monarchia, he's a Catholic monarchist. Um, so we're always concerned about the peculiar literary style. And the, you know, where did they, where do they get those toys? McCarthy, Morrison, and uh, O'Connor, they get them from Faulkner. It's not the same style, but it's a style that stands out and hits you right in the face from the get-go. Um, and that has to do uh, with a way of seeing the world as the world, as something out there in front of you and, and, and incarnational and created. That said, uh, all those uh, authors, um, for, beginning with Faulkner, indulge in the grotesque, you know, which something goes horrible and laughable at the same time. We had a good taste of that last night if you went to the play uh, in the theater because the, 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 the comic dimension of, uh, of O'Connor really came out, you know, with all these laugh lines. They're not howlers, but irony uh, and the comic are, are revealing. The thing that uh, all these authors have in common with Faulkner and with Flaubert, is you have empathy and irony working back and forth and swirling around uh, each other. Girard says about um, a great novelist, uh, a great novelist loves his characters. He doesn't judge them. You know? And O'Connor, we know she doesn't ju judge her. There's plenty of judgment going on. She, they don't need, you see, Flannery O'Connor to add to it. Uh, and the mimetic theory of 101, uh, the famous statement, the fox knows many things, the hedgehog one big one. Well, Girard has one idea. The great minds have one idea. Newton, gravity. Darwin, natural selection. Girard, mediation, modeling, uh, imitation. Uh, and it leads him to his next great insight, drawn from uh, Heraclitus, quote, war, strife, polymas, is the father of, and king of all. Some he has made gods, some men, some slaves, some free. Which means that all social differences issue from violence. Man's problem is, is, is not how to deal with the violence of nature. The biggest threat to human life is human, period. So um, we, get not, we get through the great writers, we don't get the New Yorker's cartoon of the individual. Uh, those blue lines, if they're visible, is my you know revising us so that uh, we aren't we we aren't we don't bootstrap. We cannot. We are being tugged and pulled on all sides by uh, others, uh, models, the social others, society, markets, advertising, etc. That's pretty obvious. And so these images speak for themselves. That the desire for any object is mediated by a model, uh, a model which is uh, uh, proliferated in, in, in the media. And uh, desire obviously needs a model to fasten on an object. And we see this in the playground, but we also see it in the halls of power, in the corridors of power, and in military conflict. And this is an image which requires no explanation whatsoever. It's one I cribbed from my nephew, Stephen McKenna, who has been picking up on Girard and doing wonderful work with it in the media. So you go from this image in the playground to this, and it's particularly interesting because the formal difference, the difference between the black and white squares is purely formal, black, white. Black is just non-white and white is non-black, which is, has a lot to say about racism in this country uh, because there are no whites and there are no blacks. Whiteness is something over against blackness. Um, and the over against phenomenon, 
is evidence in this New Yorker cartoon. The caption reads, uh, so there's more to being a, a crypt than just being an anti-blood, right? And the answer is no. The answer is no. We need enemies uh, in order to consolidate our identity. Identity is a function uh, of uh, group identity. I'm quoting this wonderful book, Jonathan Sachs, who does a mimetic reading of Genesis. It's all about sibling rivalry. Uh, and the basic organization of culture is a circle which is convened around a center, according to Durkheim, but that center is occupied by the sacrificial victim, by the enemy. And the expulsion of the enemy precisely brings about collaboration, cooperation, solidarity, community. So I get to Flaubert because he doesn't, um, he wrote this story toward the end of his life. Um, you see two images. Um, he purchased a stuffed parrot. And um, my point about this is that he purchased this parrot to write this story about a woman whose last love is this parrot. So much she loves it, she has it, you know, stuffed. And he put, and he would just watch it, like, look at me, think about me. He put himself in the place of this poor, peasant, illiterate woman. Attention, contemplation, meditation, um, reflection. Attention is a form of prayer, according to Simone Weil. And Flaubert is... Um, Absolute proof of that. So he purchased this stuffed parrot and, and contemplated it late uh, to get into the story of Felicity. She's illiterate, uneducated, she's totally guileless house servant whose story is one long streak of decomposition of losses. She loses her parents, she loses her betrothed, her, the children in her charge as a domestic servant. Both of them, one dies, one moves away. She her, her cherished nephew uh, uh, dies, her mistress dies, her parrot dies. So she has it stuffed, and it's resurrection. You see, it's a parody of the resurrection. Uh, the, the taxidermist, you know, your pet. It rots in the image in, on, on the right-hand side of my screen. You can see the rot. Um, it, and it rots apace with her loss of sight and hearing. So you have a total brrrr. Uh, the, the dryer is winding down rather than speeding up. She has only known disappointment. And unlike most, she has grown the better for it. She's a simple, simple heart. And um, that was the first of three stories by Flaubert. The first one having to do with the, um, the decapitation of John the Baptist is told in dead can realist narrative. Second with the wife of St. Julian, uh, Julian Hospitalier, uh, as he says at the end, as told in the windows of Rouen Cathedral. You have to imagine what it took out of Flaubert. Just look at those windows. Look at it. I mean, take a look. How do you get a legend out of that? Um, you just keep looking. You keep looking. Uh, because, it, again, the church is precisely the Bible of the liter illiterate in the Middle Ages. So we get to Flaubert. And I uh, highlighted um, the asterisks, a few uh, telling statements. She's taking her charges of Virginia to her communion catechism lessons. Um, and the, the priest gave a short account of the sacred history. She thought she saw the paradise, the deluge. I'm skipping lines here. Um, then she wept, listening to the passion. She, she's, she's empathic. The Catholic imagination is empathic. And at the same time, critical, ironical, and comical. That's how you get Southern Gothic. That's how you get uh, the grotesque. Um, this is free and direct discourse. This is her, she, her entering into the narrative that she's hearing. Why had they crucified him? This one who loved the children, fed the multitudes, cured the blind, and had, the, and had uh, desired in his gentleness to be born amid the poor in the dung of the stable. Then it goes on to say that, well, so the seed tide harvests, she knew all about that. She was born a peasant. And then in the next asterisk says, um, she had trouble imagining, or you, the lamb, Love for the Lamb of God, the doves because of the Holy Spirit. So she loves the doves. She had trouble imagining its person, the Holy Spirit. For it was not only a bird, but beside that a fire and other times a breath. And I don't have my students say, okay, somebody draw a bird on the blackboard. Fine, good. Okay, you're next. You draw a dove. You can draw a dove. Okay, now draw a breath. It's invisible. But you know it's there. And the breath, Flaubert's fascination is, is part and parcel with this idea of literary inspiration. 
Um, and I'm convinced that this is a story that, obviously it's a great literary work, uh, because it, is, it engages the author's uh, ambition, three minutes, okay, three minutes, uh, with, um, the, with inspiration. Uh, in the 19th century, we placed the idea, placed the, the, the image of the hero and the saint with the genius. Victor Hugo, 200,000 people go to his funeral. And um, the, the genius doesn't really believe in his inspiration if he's really good at it. So he keeps working at it, reworking it. This is Flaubert. And again, somebody points out that, you know, he wrote a paragraph a day, if that much. Um, the other paragraphs concern uh, her total misunderstanding uh, of dogmas. They make no sense to her. And as a cradle Catholic of the 50s, I can guarantee you that's a that's a valid experience. A whole paragraph on her kind-heartedness. She, after her, um, she lost other people. She took in Polish refugees. She took in a cripple and stuff like that. Um, she came to, um, but her thing was the, with, with the Holy Spirit because the last thing in her life was her parrot. And she observed in a sort of cartoonish image of, you know, there's John the Baptist there's a, baptizing Jesus and there's the, the bird there. And she would um, pray uh, and looking at that image, trying to figure out what is the Holy Spirit, and then she'd look at the parrot. You know? So when she dies, um, oh, I've lost a slide here. Uh, 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 no fair. Her last moments. Um, uh, there's a liturgy of Corpus Christi going on outside, and um, she. Uh, and as your vapor rose in Felicity's room, she opened her mouth, inhaling a mystic sensuality, Catholic imagination. Um, her lips smiled. The beats of her heart slowed down, grew fainter and softer, like a fountain giving out, like an echo dying away. This, the, the rhythm, fountain, echo. And when she exhaled her last breath, she thought she saw in the opening heavens a gigantic parrot hovering overhead. <laughs> it's a delusion, it's hallucination. Um, and it's funny and it's ironic and it's sad and it's very touching because this is a life saved, you see. And uh, Flaubert was fascinated by religion, couldn't believe a word of it, but also couldn't accept any of the gereda, any of the repetition and the bromides and the cliches and the stereotypes which are passing over dinner tables, conversation, public fora, and especially the media, you see. Uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, became a symbol, if you will, of literary creation. Okay, time's up. Thank you. Beautiful. Well. Well, I'm also plugging Flaubert, you know. I mean, to read it in French, the, the, I mean, the prose is, is just, there are lyrical frights, and the, and, and the, the whole idea is that he writes and rewrites and writes. Flaubert created the idea of the novel <coughs> as a work of art. Because Balzac is just, you know, writing and riffing and crazy. J Henry James sat at the feet of Flaubert, so did George Eliot. The idea of the novel to be a work of art. So it had to be like, just as good as those Gothic cathedrals. Please welcome Cynthia Hayden. Does this thing work? What? This way? Is this good? No problem. Last August, uh, America watched in horror as a shooting spree killed 27 people in El Paso. Latinos had been targeted. More shock followed a few hours later Another shooter, this time in Dayton, Ohio, killed nine before he was caught. The initial assumption was that a racist, anti-immigrant outlook fueled both events. But the second killer turned out instead to be pro-Satan, left-winger, anti-Trump supporter of Elizabeth Warren. Easy narratives were upended, and the Ohio police admitted that they were stumped about motive. But there was indeed a pattern, and it was this one, imitation. The Dayton shooter had been following Texas events, liking several comments about the carnage on Twitter. Sorry, can you do something about the sound? Can you get out of here? The what? The sound, it's not, there's something wrong with the sound, we can't hear you. 
Shall I lean down like this? <laughs> What's wrong? Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Is this better? No. Marginally better? <laughs> Should I hold it up? I can't hold it up. Is it better if I go like this? Okay. Should I start over again? Did you hear the first part? Okay, I'll start over again. Okay, same words. In August, America watched in horror as a shooting spree killed 22 people in El Paso. Latinos had been targeted, but more shock followed a few hours later. Another shooter, this time in Dayton, killed nine before he was caught. The initial assumption was it was a racist, anti-immigrant outlook fueling both events. But the second killer turned out to be pro-Satan, left-winger, anti-Trump supporter of Elizabeth Warren. So the easy narratives were upended, and the Ohio police admitted that they were stumped about the motive. But there was an, indeed a pattern, and it was a Girardian one, imitation. The Dayton shooter had been following Texas events, liking several comments about the carnage on Twitter, and he'd long been fascinated by shooting sprees. That storyline, however, was less appealing and indicted no political faction. Rather, it pointed to a welter of social and cultural factors inflamed by the media, which, in the era of Facebook and Twitter, is all of us. Rene Girard wrote that human behavior is driven by imitation, we are, after all, social creatures. We want what others want. Desire is not, therefore, individual, but social. Others have colonized our desire long before we know we have it. All desire is desire for being, Rene said, and it's one of my favorite statements from him. Because we long for what we lack, and we imagine it in others. The pursuit of the desired object is thus a metaphysical quest to fill a hole within ourselves because we glorify and idealize the other. So we attempt to imitate them. We want what they want because we hope to acquire their being, believing that if we get the same lover or spouse, the same job, drive the same car, or read the same novel, we will somehow acquire their admired essence and resemble them. It's the relationship of a relic to a saint, as Gerard wrote. Yet the phantom being that you covet proceeds as you pursue it, and the chase becomes frustrating and futile. Gerard read ancient and modern texts and poured over 19th century anthropology, but in the end, the most overlooked takeaway is this. It's not just that mankind is mimetic, it's that you are. It's that we are persecutors while we are imagining ourselves to be victims every single day. The place to verify his theories is not in Mesopotamia or ancient Greece, but in your own heart and conscience. What can we do about the predicament we face? Rene suggested personal sanctity. I'd like to review his major concepts, will be familiar to some of you, but by no means all. Gerard overturned three widespread assumptions about the nature of desire and violence. First, that our desire is authentic and our own. Second, that we fight from our differences rather than our sameness. And third, that religion is the cause of violence rather than an archaic solution for controlling violence within a society. Can you still hear me? <laughs> the idea of mimesis is hardly foreign to the social sciences today, but no one had made a little linchpin in a theory of human competition and violence as Gerard did beginning in the 1950s. Freud and Marx were in error. One supposed sex to be the building block of human behavior. The other saw economics as fundamental. But the true key is mimetic desire, which precedes and drives both. Imitation steers our sexual longing and economic trends. It's why we are driven to en or enroll our child in a posh school, our imagined need for the newest iPhone, um, our wish to be five pounds slimmer. When Apple invents a new gym crack, 
we, you must get it to be you know, up to date and chic like the other trendsetters, and there's no problem. They manufacture these things by the zillions. Problems arise where scarcity imposes limits, or when we eye something that cannot be shared, or that the possessor has no wish to share, an inheritance, a wife, a presidency. Hence, Gerard claimed that mimetic desire is not only the reason that we love, or the way that we love, it's the reason we fight. Two hands that reach towards the same object will ultimately clench into fists. Whatever two or three people want, soon everyone will want. The medic desire spreads contagiously as people converge on the same person, position, or possession as the answer to a prayer or the solution to a problem. Dante's Florence, Shakespeare's Verona, Black Friday in any major city, mm -hmm. um, on one level is the same story. Imitation puts us in direct competition with the person we adore, the rival, rival we ultimately come to hate and worship, who responds by defending his or her turf. As competition intensifies, the rivals copy each other more and more, even if they're only copying the reflected image of, the self, of themselves that they see in the other. The foes become more and more alike as they use the same tactics, exchange the same insults, vie for the same status symbols, or curry favor from those they see as above themselves. Over time, this object becomes secondary or irrelevant. The rivals are now obsessed with each other and their fight becomes an end in itself. Bystanders are drawn into taking sides in mimetic conformity with their admired friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Thus, the conflict can envelop a whole society with cycles of retaliatory and therefore imitative violence and one-upsmanship. Look at our political campaigns. Eventually, one group or individual is seen as responsible for the contagion, generally someone who is an outsider or a marginalized group of people who cannot or will not retaliate. An outsider will not inspire revenge or retaliation or enact it, and so is positioned to end the escalating cycles of, rep of reprisals. The scapegoat is killed, exiled, or otherwise gotten rid of. And that act in itself has enormous social power in its performance and in its consequences. It unites the warring factions and releases an enormous social tension, restoring harmony among individuals and within the community. The power to bring either peace and harmony or war and violence to a society was once seen as supernatural, and it still has an archaic allure today. Hence, we deify and worship our assassinated presidents, prime ministers, and monarchs, even if we despise them when they live. Gerard argues that the archaic religious sacrifice was no more than this, the ritual reenactment of the scapegoat's killing, bringing unity in the act of murder and invoking the mysterious powers that preempted social catastrophe before. You can think of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, but we've had two world wars in the last century, and now we totter on the edge of a nuclear disaster. And in the era of the internet, social contagion spreads in a way that was unimaginable even a few years ago. At his death in 2015, Rene was just beginning to see the consequences of our feverish, contagious social media, where we are free to vent our worst side, our unconsidered selves on more and more platforms. We dismiss our daily defamations as harmless, but they are not, primarily because it changes us. The mob has an attraction and magnetism and gains more power with each person who joins it, and all must join it, or they will be scapegoated themselves. It's one of those cases, if you do not howl with the wolves, the wolves will certainly howl for you. Whether engaged in murder, doxing, or defamation, the crowd demands unanimity, so that no one is responsible because everyone is. No one, after all, likes to throw the first stone. Rene put it this way in a passage that's haunting, and I find myself citing more and more, and I quote him. But we must see that there is no possible compromise between killing and being killed. For all violence to be destroyed, it would be sufficient 
for all mankind to decide uh, to decide to abide by this rule. If all mankind offered the other cheek, no cheek would be struck. If all men loved their enemies, there would be no more enemies. But if they drop away at the decisive moment, what is going to happen to the one person who does not drop away? For him, the word of life will be changed into the word of death. It is absolute fidelity to the principle to find in his own preaching that condemns Jesus. There is no other cause for his death than the love of one's neighbor lived to the very end with an infinitely intelligent grasp of the constraints it imposes. That passage is almost incomprehensible in its implications. Yet around the world, many Christians are facing that every single day. Gerard often pointed out that the word sacrifice changed with the Christian era. In the past, it always signaled the killing of others for propitiation. You make you know, sacrifice to the God. In the last two millennia, however, it has come to mean a sacrifice of oneself or something in oneself. While Abel's blood cried out from the earth for vengeance on his murderer, Jesus' blood cries out to God for mercy on us all. And that's a major paradigm shift for humanity and one that each of us has to reckon with. But our urges today are still sacrificial in the archaic sense. We long to rid our society of the right-wingers or the left-wingers, the immigrants or the nativists, the Palestinians, the Brexiteers, or the ADF. But in the high-tech information age, we can no longer claim innocence. After a century of genocides and ethnic cleansing, we cannot pretend we do not know what may happen when we demonize individuals and groups and long to rid ourselves of them. Gerard emphasized forgiveness and reconciliation, and certainly part of the Catholic imagination, to me, includes how we create ourselves in the public sphere, in an environment where hatred is spilled publicly every day without so much as a nod to conscience. People bond through gratuitous and often defamatory insult. And as Gerard predicted, we resemble our enemies more and more, all the while protesting our absolute difference. Increasingly, we don't care what kind of people we've become. People even cite Gerard's words to reinforce their political commitments and prejudices without seeing his work as a critique of precisely those kinds of commitments. In Evolution of Desire, I describe a nonviolent movement that devolved to blame, accusations, scapegoating, and expulsions. The problem is, moral indignation leads us to replicate the behavior that aroused the indignation in the first place. And so it's morally ambiguous. The more outrage, the less likely it will lead to real change, and the more likely it will lead to violence. It tends to give the outraged permission to commit or condone the acts that are just like the ones that caused the indignation in the first place. But forgiveness is the opposite of vengeance. It puts an end to the consequence of the change in the chain of events, freeing everyone from the whole process. Christ exhorted us to forgive our enemies, even love them. And it either means everyone, or it means nothing. It extends to the hundreds of young men two, year, <clears throat> two years ago in Charlottesville who held tiki torches and raised their arms in a Nazi salute, apparently celebrating a system of ideas that has been thoroughly discredited, resulting in the death of a young woman who was killed when an enraged man drove into the crowd. What are the odds that these fellows have been closet white supremacists all along, waiting, <clears throat> waiting for their moment in the sun, waiting for a lapse, and political correctness to throw off their anonymity. Let me offer a more likely scenario. In regions of the country where jobs are menial and few and unions no longer guarantee a living wage, those who are despised and living precariously have wanted social recognition for years. They have now found a way to get our attention since they could not get our respect. 
As mimetic creatures, we seek the eyes of others for their validation. If we cannot get their approval, we will revel in their fear, which is simply a different kind of validation, a validation of power and efficacy. We have not lost our tendency to scapegoat, and it can still unify us. The term white nationalist has been bandied about so profligately that it has become meaningless except to stigmatize and create a stampede of persecution. We are sucked into the gyre of a panicky witch hunt for the targeted offenders. The effects are immediate and deadlier during a hot summer in a land where guns carry a long history and a singular thank you mystique, which is itself a mimetic phenomenon, our relationship to guns. Look at the movies where heroes have packed heat since the days of John Wayne. How do we get out of that? We still trust our weaponry to restore, resolve conflict, even the conflict within. And every few weeks, some adolescent takes uh, out, acts out that fantasy in our streets, in our supermarkets, or in our schools. Gerard concluded, we must face our neighbors and declare unconditional peace. Even if we are provoked, challenged, we must give up violence once and for all. He called for universal forgiveness while there is still time. Those are the closing words of the scapegoat. But what does that action of forgiveness actually mean? How does one forgive ISIS? How do we even forgive the guy who's trolling us on Twitter? <laughs> or the guy that cuts you off in traffic? We're just beginning these explorations. But at the very least, it means we must let go of the who started it mindset and walk towards a different kind of future. Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming out so early to a, a panel on Rene Girard's thought. I'm gonna have to bend over even further, I, I fear. Um, so one of the things I've been fascinated in in my own research over the last several years is the, the work of the philosopher uh, Giorgio Agamben, an Italian thinker. And one of the ideas that deeply fascinates me in his work is his concept of what he calls absolute profanation. And he says one of the main tasks that humanity faces in the upcoming decades is to render profane the things we had once deemed to be sacred. Because that form of sacrality that surrounds so many of our institutions and organizations, but also notions of human being, are traversed by a ceaseless tension that really is predicated upon sacrifice. Now this is a Gombin talking and he's making no reference to someone like Girard. Though I've asked him about Girard, and he said he's not opposed to Girard's thesis. <laughs> but I've, I find it interesting that his notion of profanation or return to common use of what had once been deemed sacred is his solution to removing what he calls the theological signatures that grounded natural laws and visions of the human, the human being. Uh, that's his solution to ending the violence that permeates our world. It's interesting, too, because the philosopher Slavoj Žižek, a very colorful character, uh, has responded to Agamben by basically saying, at what point does the quest for absolute profanation return to the zero ground of what we consider the sacred to be? But of course, Agamben says nothing about what that may look like, and Žižek says nothing about what that could look like, and we're left in an empty space of negativity where nothing appears, no content, simply the eradication of everything that we once had deemed to be sacred and everything we thought had undergirded the institutions and identities that were so important to us. And I take that as a starting point for my reflection on the work of Rene Girard for several reasons. One of which being the common question posed to Girard, even by Girardians, of what comes in the wake of mimetic desire. If all we do is imitate each other and that perpetuates the violence we do to each other and the acts of scapegoating, 
what is the world supposed to look like in the absence of mimetic contagion? And I think along with that, the criticism that's also put to Girard, is your analysis merely a negative critique that removes all institutions and leaves nothing in its wake? And these, of course, are, are joined together inseparably. So it's in this context that I find it helpful to recall something like John Milbank's critique of Girard, that Girard's thought is an entirely negative enterprise focused on eradicating the false sacred from our world by exposing the single victim mechanism and making it inoperative without suggesting anything to take its place. Of course, for Milbank, this is a threat to the church itself. Girard's project by this count, and this is Milbank's word, but it's his word for nearly everybody, uh, is a nihilistic project, providing the possible end of most institutions and traditions in our world without conceiving of what a truly just order might look like. Every order is consequently subject to a deconstruction based on its inherently violent proclivities, but what remains to be built once the false sacred has been removed? In other words, what place is there for the sacred in our world if our time is mainly spent on the removal of the false forms of sacrality? How are we to recognize something like a sacramental nature of existence when we need to spend most of our time trying to diffuse and disengage the violent mechanisms that have sustained human existence and certainly have, that have sustained religious being for so many millennia? Now, this leads in the, the work of another Italian philosopher, Gianni Vadimo, to a particular canonic reading of Christian truth claims that lead him to formulate what he calls nihilism as a postmodern Christianity. That the loss of the sacred, the death of God in Nietzsche's work, and so much else we associate with modern critiques of religion actually leads to a different or alternate form of religiosity very provocatively, he calls this nihilism as the most likely or probable form of religiosity in our epoch. Within his claim of a weak theology, as you can imagine, is mainly just the destruction of false idols and false forms of divinity. The apparent destruction of traditional religious structures seems to be the end of religion as we've known it, and certainly parallels movements on secularism and atheism in our world today. Though it's also, he wagers, as I think Zizek speculated on Agamben's work, the beginning of an authentic experience of the grounds of the sacred. Though such a thing could and even should perhaps never be clearly defined or made into a normative proposition. Maybe we should shy away from trying to make institutions out of these inclinations. But then, of course, what does that look like? How do you represent such a thing? Do we not have structures and institutions we need for social welfare, for well-being. In fact, isn't that the nature of language itself, which is often a violent and reductive institution? But Vadimo recognizes the difficulty of this, but also suggests in the context of Christianity, to be sure, quote, this also makes problematic the positive aspects of Christianity, namely its institutional expression in churches, dogmas, authorities, and disciplines. But might not these very complexities, or even more an active contestation of institutions, dogmas, and churches, be exactly what Christianity needs today? End quote. Now this, of course, is exactly what orthodox religious persons fear, I would say. Uh, it's certainly what Milbank was afraid of. Yet, I would argue, is this not precisely where we need to formulate something like, and this is my, my wager here, Something like a philosophy of love, which sounds so idealistic and utopian, I realize that. And yet, we all know love to be real and true, and it does exist. Though it's almost impossible to formulate as a normative order. But a philosophy of love that's perhaps indistinguishable from the sacramental experience of grace. Whatever such a thing may or may not be, right? So then what does all the talk of nihilism and the death of God amidst any possible recovery of a contentless sacrality have to do with Girardian thought. So I would argue that trying to envision a world beyond mimetic desire is neither a wholly nihilistic nor a wholly utopian affair, though I do think it bears shades of both, to be sure. It inevitably has to. 
It's perhaps to be understood as the domain of a self-sacrificing love that is illuminated best through negative acts, through the removal of what is not love. The Christian narrative makes clear that love is made possible as an opening to vulnerability, as an endlessly canonic giving that empties the one who loves. The one who loves pours themselves out to the point of rendering themselves subject to abuse, deception, or becoming the possession of another. But this does not stop love from making such gestures, like it falls right into the mimetic trap. As Jacques Lacan once famously quipped in his seminar on love, when love comes up against hate, love allows hate to win. This is simply the nature of love, though, certainly, humans frequently attempt to conceal and distort this reality in an attempt to render ourselves less vulnerable to others, less likely to be scapegoated, or to fuel and dis sorry, or to fuel the fires of mimeticism. Such concealment, however, is done at the cost of losing the experience of love itself something incredibly difficult to describe, if not impossible. More recently, Simon May's conclusion regarding love, which shares with another uh, philosopher of love, Harry Frankfurt, is that love is not dependent on a particular moral or institutional code. So an insight that allows May to consider a wholly secular approach to loving, even as he's able at the same time to make sense then of why humanity has historically identified the powers of love with the existence of a higher being. The deity who is or who typifies love stands outside of any moral or institutional order, guaranteeing its existence as the sovereign who says it may be, but not being identified with the order itself. Love, it seems, escapes every order or system that we could fabricate. It is thus more at home in the discourse of mystics, attempting to reach outward toward it in complete unknowing than it is in the hands of an overly scrupulous religious zealot. In Frankfurt's words, quote, the function of love is not to make people good. Its function is just to make their lives meaningful and thus to help make their lives in a way that, in a way that was good for them to live. Whatever one constructs later on, whatever moral system or institutional tradition, love stands always outside and beyond these ever meager structures maintain its, within itself a latent force capable of destroying each and every human achievement. But of course, love destroys these things only so that it may get closer to loving what lays beyond all these representations that we might put in its path. So the typical speech of lovers of, I wish I could express to you how I, how I love you, but my words fail to adequately convey it, becomes the very precondition of an authentic act of loving. Love yearns to touch what cannot be said or seen, again, putting us in close proximity to traditional conceptualizations of the divine being. It's helpful to imagine divine beings in this regard, and especially the act of trying to relate to them, the, the traditional domain of prayer, because love is given in such a way that one does not accept, or so, one, sorry, one does not expect reciprocation, thus once again breaking down a mimetic barrier. In fact, one may not even hear a voice speaking back to it after it is given thus severing the ties of established relations between persons, as both Simon May and Agamben have noted. Kierkegaard had also once noted the same thing in the act of loving those who are deceased, as this is the greatest act of love, he thought, since one loves but cannot be loved in return. Once again, severing the possibilities for mimeticism. Everything is given and nothing is presumed to be given back. What May considers as both the command of and yet the freedom within the act of loving. For May, this passionate search for the ultimate ground of our being, whether religious in nature or secular, it matters little at this point, is the purpose of human life and the grounds for the establishment of being. What takes place in a non-reciprocating intimacy without relations, as Agamben calls it, is what Kierkegaard called the most unselfish, the freest, the most faithful love. It's a love that preserves the mystery of the other, who cannot ever fully be known and certainly cannot be possessed. Such a love, as Lucy Irigare has described it, is what protects the obscurity and the silence that the other remains for me, is that which aids in discovering proximity. This posits love in Agamben's language, and it's interesting that 
after his big uh, Homo Sacher series dealing with violence and sacrifice, he turns to love in the final volume. This posits love as an inappropriable object that can only be shared, something for common use, but not to be possessed. It's what lies beyond the mimetic. To share what is ultimately inappropriable, that is love. There are, of course, and I think in a, a Girardian context, we have to be attentive to this dynamic. There are, of course, deep political implications for seeing love in this way. As Simon Critchley asserts concerning the anarchy of love, quote, the only proof of immortality is the act of love, the daring that attempts to extend beyond oneself by annihilating oneself, to project onto something that exceeds one's power of projection. To love is to give what one does not have and to receive that over which one has no power. The point is not to kill others, but to kill oneself in order that a transformed relation to others becomes possible, some new way of conceiving the common and being with others. Again, to allow love into one's life and into the construction of their very being is to allow anarchy at times to run riot. It's deconstructive force maneuvering past and through whatever established relations and structures had guided one previously. The self is undone in the face of what can only appear as a nihilistic force, a negative force, bent on the destruction of everything that one had thought they could hold dear beforehand. But this anarchical power is also the mystical yearning for a force that can remake us at the same time. Even if such a remaking lies entirely beyond the scope of what one can imagine. And so you're left like a Girardian saying, I don't know what comes after. I don't know what takes place next. I only know what needs to go away. As we see repeatedly in Vadimo's thought, there's an absolute kenosis taking place that seems to defy anything like a pure resurrection, asking us to consider whether we can or even should want to escape representation and its reductive violences. In other words, is the goal of a nihilistic apophatic thought a complete and perhaps unrealistic nonviolence which cannot really be embodied? Certainly not those of us who use language. To tangle with love is to contemplate, however, one's demise, a small death that is also an ecstatic union. We're taken out of ourselves in an ecstasis, an almost loss of consciousness at the same moment we are profoundly united in and through love. But how are we to imagine this in practical, concrete, real terms? That's always the question. Answering this, much as contemplating a world without mimetic contagion, is a decidedly idealistic, even utopian goal, one brought about through perhaps nihilistic means. And yet we know love to exist beyond the violent mechanisms of our world. Was this not the essential message that Christianity, among other religions, had sought to lift up above all else? If May's suggestion regarding the secular nature of love bears any weight, then we might be able to see how something like a sacramental and canonic love is not only not afraid to lose the moral, institutional, and religious orders that had seemed to sustain it, it's actually compelled at times to renounce them and even perhaps to see their end or betray them. So that something truly sacred might appear, though we cannot name it. Though in the end, even the duality of the sacred and the profane disappears, and we're left with only what lies before our eyes, asking us to love it and expecting nothing in return. It's in this sense that we might begin to understand how religion may actually empty itself canonically, sacramentally, to the point of ceasing to exist, allowing a secular space to flourish and allowing us perhaps to take theology seriously for the first time as the grounds of human existence even and especially when God has appeared to have left the picture. Perhaps this was what many years ago Heidegger had referred to as the twist in the historical narrative of metaphysics, a radical transformation and distortion of its very contents through the events that transpire within being itself. Thank you. Presentation. Um, is there a? Does this move over to the table? It or? doesn't. And okay. so I, I apologize, but um, when you go to answer questions, if they could come up. And
and answer them from here. Okay, we'll, we can do that. All right, that's all right, thank you. Um, you can see mimetic theories applications across multiple disciplines here from literature to social commentary to theology. Um, we can take questions on any of those subjects. <laughs> Um, or anything else that's coming to mind. Um, if you've had a burning question about mimetic theory and want to ask it to someone, this is the time. I have a burning question, so go ahead. Yes. Um, <clears throat> for anyway, you were talking about not necessarily exactly mimetic theory, but language as violence. Could you expound on that and what? Uh, I guess in what way you see language as violence? Yeah, the, the question is to, to Colby about explaining his statement that language is in many ways a violent construct. Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, the, the way I'm referring to it is that language represents a, a system of reductive representations. I mean, it is a system of reductive representations. Every time you formulate something into words, you are being reductive of the experience itself. And in presenting that, even if it's what Jacques Derrida called a bloodless violence, you're still reducing the fullness of whatever complexity you're facing. So you could say whatever form of life or existence presents itself to you, to reduce it to the extremely narrow confines of language is to do some harm to it. When I teach students, I often talk about how, um, you know, when I was young and we took standardized testing, it said, are you, are you white or are you black or are you other? You know, and everyone else felt left out. And there was a process of scapegoating at work to fit a certain, you know, matrix of representations beforehand. And now we have, you know, a hundred different ethnicities possible and yet some small minority saying, I'm, I'm being left out of that. And there's never going to be a full, you know, exhaustive list. There will always be some reduction taking place that excludes someone else. It's the nature of language. We could say it's the nature of logic. I mean, read Heidegger's seminars on logic. It's, it's like reading, sounds weird. It's like reading Girard in a different key. Logic itself, the order of reason, the way we construct thought is always an exclusive process. So we will posit an order that leaves out something. So the precondition of whatever order we have established is that something gets left out and excluded. So how do you deal with those exclusions becomes very crucial here. Does the language or whatever symbolic system you work with seek to, you know, to be open to recalling those things that had excluded, or does it seek to repress them violently, like the way Paul Ricoeur talks about history and memory, um, or or do you allow those things to come back into view? Every language will be reductive, but does it pay attention to the areas of violence it does, or does it choose not to? So I was, I was referring to something like that. You know, the thing is, I'm reminded, Andrew, I mean, I'm, it's a cliche, Andrew, I don't remember. Andrew, what, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, my technophobia is on high. Um, Spinoza or Leibniz, you can tell. All determination is negation. Um, the Gerardian insight to that question is that we always, um, we always look for the least violent component of any system to blame the violence on it, you know. And the whole deconstructive critique of the violence of language, demand Derrida. That's a blind. That's a totally blind. I mean, after all, we're talking about the logos. If we're talking about the Catholic imagination, we're talking about the word of God and the incarnation. And um, you think of the mystics. They're trying to find language for something which they feel very powerfully, which they know is true and real. So get off the violent language. That's over. Um, thank you. And by the way, we have great literature. We still think that's a good idea to have it around. Um, that is language brought, brought to its possible perfection. It's possible perfection. But to use uh, Agavan's friends about a truly just society, I go back to Rambo. <coughs> la vision de la justice, c'est le privilège de Dieu seul. The vision of justice is the privilege of God alone. We try to create a justice. You know, and, and paraphrasing Dostoevsky, you want justice? Go to hell. Because that's where you'll find it, etc. But we have great writers, and we and the better the writing, the truer the vision, etc. Right before we 
that the conversation is a wonderful example of the question, what is God doing in the midst of our violent structures? And God is not against them in any way, because to be against them is to be part of them. And so the question that we always ask at our conference is around theological questions is, how is God building something up in the midst of what is already here that will someday blossom and become the here? <laughs> um, so that, that is the great uh, question of how to live our faith in the midst of that which is apparently not being fully, not fully embodying uh, what God's desires are at the moment. Um, so other, other questions, other topics. Yes. Sorry, I'm struggling to articulate this, but um, I thought it was all of those absolutely fantastic presentations. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> something that I've been thinking about is the notion of time and the notion particularly of progress and whether this assumption, I mean, that presumably Girard believed that in the Christian revelation there was at least the possibility of an answer to the problems created by mimesis. Um, but now we are talking about having to destroy that kind of, that structure or pass beyond that structure in order to find a you know a further solution to it, and that seems to me <coughs> to make an assumption about human nature changing in some way, because presumably those institutions which developed to deal with those things were a response to a fundamental human need. Has that fundamental human need changed? And if so, why? Is it part of some kind of progressive or degenerative process? That's kind of what I would like to get yeah. to. Yeah, where are we going, panelists? <laughs> oh, it's Mo. Come, sorry. yes. Again, I mean, Colby can respond uh, more precisely to this with the language of profanation, desacralization, disenchantment, and things like that. But of course, it's both. Um, the, um, we're, the thing is, um, is, I don't know how to hook that question of uh, pro progress. We have technologies, we have modern medicine, we have uh, vaccinations, etc. And then we have these things are still um, in contest with our weaponry and our consumerism. Uh, but I don't think there's any change in human nature. Really. Uh, what, you, what culture has, you see, the whole world is Western now. And and what it, and the drive of Western, as Colby has made clear, is precisely to deinstitutionalize. Um, and so we're attacking um, the institutions both from the left and the right. And then of course, what happens in a very Gerardian way? They're the left and the right are only attacking each other. Yeah. Forget the institutions. Yeah. And then you're in the maelstrom. But human nature has not changed. It has simply reached its you know apex of possibilities or negativities. That's my, you know, sort of uh, Girardian answer. Thank you. Cynthia, would you like to say something? Yeah, I think. Rene didn't talk about it as much, but he did talk about good mimesis and positive mimesis. In fact, if you're going to be at Notre Dame on Monday, I'm going to be giving a talk talking about good mimesis and uh, but I, have a, I would rather quote Rene, frankly, than quote myself. <laughs> Rene said, um, these are a few quotes that I'm going to be saying on Monday. Rene wrote, whenever you have that desire, I would say that really active, positive desire for the other, other there is some kind of divine grace present. If we deny this, we move into some form of optimistic humanism. Um, Kindness escalates and turns into what we call love, which obviously animals don't have. But it escalates the other way too, and it turns into deadly violence, which animals don't have either. But whether you exchange compliments, niceties, greetings, or insinuation, indifference, meanness, bullets, atom bombs, it's always an exchange. You give to the other guy what he's giving to you, or you try to do so. I would say that mimetic desire, even when bad, is intrinsically good in the sense that far from being merely imitative in a small sense, it's the opening out of oneself. Yes, extreme openness. It is everything. It can be murderous, it can be rivalrous, but it is also the basis of heroism, a devotion to others, and everything. And occasionally Rene would speak about 
flipping the switch on mimesis. Uh, one example he used was a woman taken in adultery, where there's a whole mob and everybody's wondering what Jesus is scribbling on the, I mean, there's been whole things written about why was he scribbling on the ground. Rene says he was buying time. There's a mob there. They're ready to go. Just let's, you know, take a breath. And then he says, let him without sin cast the first stone. And everyone says, uh, you know, moderns say, ah, that means all of them were doing stuff too. They had it off with her. But he says, no, it's that nobody wants to be the first. Rather than be the first, they would not rather throw the stone at all. It can only happen when you can deny responsibility. So what happens, they all kind of look at each other and they begin shuffling off. The oldest goes, the eldest goes first, the elder of this village, and then they all kind of go down to the last one. Um, that would be an example of reversing the process of mimesis. Um, so it, it can be done, but it takes courage, and obviously it taste, takes risk on oneself. Yeah, the question of time is a, a big one in mimetic theory, and I want, I would love to recommend a book by James Allison, if you're not familiar with his work. He's a theologian working with um, mimetic theory. And he has a book called Raising Abel, which is, I forget the <coughs> subtitle, but I think it's something about moving from the apocalyptic to the, an eschatological imagination. And the question is that once Jesus resurrected and ascended into heaven, he gave us a story whose ending is not known yet. <laughs> so how do you live in a space where the ending, which is normally defined by death, exclusion, <coughs> finiteness, um, is now open? And no one knows the end, and it ha won't have anything to do with death. And that's the subject of his book, and I think it's a wonderful meditation on that, that question about where are we going. Um, yeah. I think we have time for another question. Yes, back room. Thank you for your presentation. I guess this question is directed mostly at Cynthia and Colby. Um, I was just, my attention was drawn to a recent article that won an award from the Social Science Association, published by August 18. They asked 6,000 6, respondents in Denmark and the United States whether they agreed or disagreed with a series of statements. And the New York Times just reported on this, and this is the report around the hearing. The responses to three of the statements in particular were staggering with different sets. 24% agreed that society should be burned to the ground. 40% concurred with the thought that when it comes to our political and social institutions, I cannot help thinking we just let them all burn. And 40% also agreed that, quote, we cannot fix the problems in our social institutions. We need to tear them down and start over. And so I was thinking a lot about where what, what motivates that sort of that sort of affirmation of those statements, and I'm drawn to this idea that what you articulated about love opening up on this kind of like this sort of liminal time before an uncertain future um, that gets rid of those unloving institutions and behaviors. But I just worry, and maybe it's just a necessary risk. But I worry that that will always squirt with some other far more negative inclination desire just to tear it. Down, that might be motivating a lot of the Americans and Indians responding to this study. So I'm just wondering what kind of, you know, how, how, how we should negotiate that space and figure out um, how to match up that perhaps politically or socially. Um, that's a very, a very good question to continuously ask. and. In some ways, I feel like what I want to say ties into the question you were asking a moment ago about the anxieties that sometimes are generated when we think, where is this all going? Um, is it heading somewhere positive, somewhere negative? Do I need to posture you know, reactively, defensively, conservatively to preserve what seems like it may be lost, the institutions, governments, traditions, or, or do I champion their destruction in the hopes that something better may come, but know that History teaches us, of course, that something far, far worse may come in the absence of these institutions and structures. And that's that's the trick, right? So I, I often turn to, uh, there's a series of writings I love um, 
you know, the philosopher Theodore Adorno, uh, when 1968, 1969 came around and student protests were sweeping Europe and, and the West, um, he was often you know, encouraged to protest and do something radical. And he said, this is, above all, this is the time to stop and think. And that's been echoed by Zizek and Agamben and others today, philosophers who appear to be completely ivory tower you know, people in a sense. But yet what they're suggesting, I think, is very, very important. We have to find a way to preserve a space for reflection or for thought in the midst of all action. Because any cry for action and for practical uh, means in the midst of what appear to be you know, crisis moments can actually be quite detrimental if we don't take the time to stop and think about what we're actually doing. Now that sounds again very idealistic, like okay, so what do we say to these people who think that we should just burn governments down? We should tell them or encourage them to stop and think. But what I what I mean by that though is something that I think can be much more practically applicable, which is to develop self-reflexive or self-critical mechanisms in the midst of institutions. So for Agamben, this means how do you begin to contemplate anti-constitutional elements within the constitution itself. And one of the things he proposes is something like, a, he calls it the, it's based on a platonic idea of the nocturnal council, uh, an, an institution of some kind of council that exists to only repeal things, to only act negatively as a critical and self-reflexive structure within the heart of a governmental apparatus. So you can imagine this as an anti-Congress that only exists to repeal laws that it finds to be unjust, but not to bring any new ones into legislation. It's an intriguing idea, right? Like, how do we begin to, to think of a space that allows us to do the negative work, the destructive work that needs to be done as part of the daily operations of the institution itself? So not just censoring that which we deem to be unorthodox or heretical, like the CDF and the Catholic Church, um, but actively a space that wants to get self-critical about the institution that does exist and allow for creative thinking to dwell in that space. So to take those anarchic thinkers, those radicals and protesters and say, how can that be part of the institution itself? Not just to co-opt it or to domesticate it, but to allow some of that anarchic elementation to run as a normal part of its operation. And I think that's more the direction we have to head in in some ways. I can't, we're, at the, we're at the end of our time, but- One coda. Yes. Jonathan Sachs says, Israel is the only nation to create a national literature of self-criticism. He's talking about the narratives and the prophets, etc. cetera. Uh, I.e., we already, we have models for that. They're biblical. Just an impression. <clears throat> I actually have a vibe. Uh, mild voice impairment. It's not, but my voice is getting worse today, and it's all these eyes on me, you know. And I was just thinking of your question. It's all the eyes of others. Six thousand people say this, and therefore, nobody wants to be an orphan. That's the essence of hermetic theory. Nobody wants to be alone. Nobody wants to say something against the mob. I think we have to confront that fear. Or there is no hope. We have to be willing to be the one voice that flips the switch. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists once again.